Monet bought this water lily pond after he bought the farm over there. So this was a late addition. In fact, this pond is part of the Ept River. It gives it a sense of motion and life. And that's the motion and life he wants to put into his paintings. I've picked a bigger horizontal format. Now this would be like a miniature Monet water lily painting. The way to begin this is the way Monet began. Loose sketching. And he starts his sketches here, but he paints them in a studio over there. Now I'm going to rub in some color. His painting process takes a long time. He does one sitting, walks away, works for about an hour. But he needed the oil paints to dry to keep building up the layers. I'm only going to be doing this at one sitting with you. Blurring in colors first. Let me show you the palette. Use some cobalt blue, 1810. That's when this color comes in. A cadmium yellow, which was a new color. This is a lizard crimson, which is like a carmine. And if I make a deep violet out of this, I can create a condition of simultaneous contrast. The yellow is stronger because the violet is next to it. They're opposite colors on the color wheel. The other issue is called successive contrast. If I take this dark color and I make a dark square out of it, now I'm going to do the same thing with yellow right beside it. That light looks brighter than that light because the contrast level is greater here than it is here. That's successive contrast. Let's get that synthetic ultramarine blue, some brilliant rose, emerald green, copper-based azurite blue, hooker's green. There goes some violet. So I'm going to look out to immerse myself in the experience. That's how you paint this kind of painting. I admired his inversion of ideas. So I could put the sky at the bottom by reflection, turning the world upside down. The idea of the floating world is something that he inherits from Japan in the woodblocks. I'll borrow some of that ultramarine blue and then a little bit of that green. Watching him paint, people said, I only see a mess, I see chaos. It's just a slow development of something that shows the feeling, not a copying of a scene. That's the universe, life out of chaos. He's really confident of his brush strokes. He's not going to hesitate. That self-assurance is communicated to us as looser and freer strokes. He's thinking about a design very covertly. It's very subtle, but it's there so the brain can read space. There's no horizon. And to the white, I can't make tints without white. These tubes really liberated painters. So we have pre-stretched canvases, portable easels. This made the advent of Impressionism and the portable landscape painter possible. You may not see this. I'm squinting like this at the canvas. Squint, kind of a Clint Eastwood style squint. And the reason for that is it puts things out of focus. I don't want things in focus. I want to use a part of my brain that doesn't use my foveal vision. That's the part of the brain that reads words. I'm not trying to read words. I'm trying to get a sensation here. And that means I can't focus on anything. And the squinting helps do that. It also heightens values. Now the danger with the white paint is that if I mix more than a couple of colors in that white, it's subtractive mixing. Less light, less color, less luminance gets back to the eye. And so the paintings look dingier and chalkier. He uses horizontal strokes like I'm using horizontal strokes and vertical strokes. And it's this crosshatch pattern that gives you a sense of reflection. The colors and the reflections aren't as intense as the colors that are throwing the reflections. That's because light's bouncing off of the trees and the irises into the water. Now that's a chalky color. But here I want a chalky color. If it's against a strong color, then the contrast of something chalky vibrates. The Impressionists painted with opaque colors. They weren't as interested in glazing, but putting colors side by side for effect. I'm going to scrub and pull out some lights and push some things around. See the vertical and the lateral? That floats on top of the vertical. Now this pink offers, and if I add a little yellow to it, more of a simultaneous contrast against the blue-green and now the picture starts to jump as a stronger vibration. His canvas 
can show through in certain areas, the threads and the texture of the canvas. In other areas, the paint is thick, just like the surface of this lily pond. Where the lilies are, there's a tactile topography, but where the water is, it's smooth. These skylights that come through, and I'll do that by just dragging to get the shimmer and the feeling of a little movement because the water isn't still. I'm going to now float some things on the surface of this upside down world. Remember, he didn't paint the world upside down, he painted sensations that were visual. Now I'm trying to get it just right because values are what's important here. If my values are too light or too dark, I won't have something that sits on the surface. Monet had an interesting piece of advice for all artists. The bigger the vocabulary of strokes, the more interesting the painting. And it's the ambiguity of, is it on the surface? Is it underneath the surface? Which is what? Ambiguity heightens participation in the viewer. That's one of the things Impressionism discovers. You can project what you think you see. In the early 1870s, Monet and Pissarro go to London. They discover the light and experiments of Turner, how he uses atmosphere and how he dissolves edges. And they discover in the landscapes of Constable, greens they've never seen in paintings before. And it's that emerald green that becomes one of the keynote colors for the Impressionist palette. And as the lilies go from larger to smaller, your perception of space is that it's going from forward to back. That's perspective. If I see a little bit of something pinkish in a glow, I'll amplify the pink. The pink is a complement to all this green, and I need complements. Otherwise, it's an analogous harmony, all blues and greens. The yellows, the corals, the reds, they're the opposite. So that's why he puts them in. I lifted up the lip of that lily just to give you a greater sense of surface. We're hardwired to put things into symmetry. That's why I have this angling this way. Asymmetry creates an impression of more movement. I'm creating a line that goes this way, this way, this way, to pull you back into that space. Obscure and bleed. The softer the edges, the more volume. The tighter the edges, the less volume. What's called gradual transition. If you see something, a territory, that is transitioning very gradually, you think space, the sky, open water. If you see a territory that abruptly changes from gradual transition to an edge, you name it. We name and we identify on the basis of abrupt transitions. And Monet's interested in gradual transitions with a smattering of abrupt transitions, which you will call lilies. That's more opaque paint, a little overlapping, so that they float on the surface. We should keep his method in mind. The beginnings are where the feeling lies where the impression lies, and that's what Corot had told Monet. Trust your first impression. So I'm going to take the tape off this painting now and see how it looks. And so it is for Monet, so it is for me. We'll stop with the beginning. 